Shalom, everyone. My name is Sister Estelle, and on behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this interfaith conversation on the Holy Spirit. At a time when our country is being torn apart by racial hatred and violence, we are grateful to be able to gather with all of you in a spirit of unity and peace. Today, moderated by our host, John Sweeney, we will be talking with Rabbi David Zaslow and Jack Levison on who and what is the Holy Spirit in the Jewish and Christian traditions. Since we have just celebrated both Shavuot and Pentecost, we thought this would be a stimulating topic to discuss across faith traditions. There will be a time for questions at the end of this hour, so please use your Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen to post any questions and we will get to those. I will also be posting various links in the chat bar if you'd like to keep that open. Our recording of today's presentation will be available later to share with anyone who couldn't join us and we'll also let you know how to get copies of both Rabbi Zaslow and Jack Levis's books. Rabbi Rabbi David We're experiencing a little bit of an internet connectivity issue. So maybe John, you could make a quick introduction. Oh. Chris, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Oh, sure. Well, I think what she was going to say is she was going to introduce uh, the two gentlemen who are with me. Um, I don't have anything printed in front of me, but uh, Rabbi David Zaslow is the uh, rabbi of the Hakara Synagogue in Ashland, Oregon. And the oh, wait. I think we're with you. <laughs> well, and the author of two terrific books that you see on your screen right there, Jesus First Century Rabbi and Reimagining Exodus, both of which were published by Paraclete Press. And uh, Professor Jack Levison is in Texas and is the the something chair of uh, of Hebrew Bible or Old Testament at SMU. I don't know what the name of that chair is, but Jack will remind us. And he's he's been out dressing me for years. <laughs> Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Am I unmuted, John? Or unmuted? Because my daughter, a store went out of uh, a store went out of business in Snyder Plaza near SMU, and these are like a hundred and fifty dollar tie she got for ten bucks. So, so well, there you go. And this is a Nordstrom rack shirt. I'm living the life. All right. Well, well, and then I'll just I'll introduce myself. I am the publisher at Paraclete okay. Press. I am also uh, married to a ra I'm a practicing Catholic who's married to a rabbi. So. I have a particular interest in the sorts of topics that we are discussing today, aside from the fact that I've published these two gentlemen's terrific, terrific books. Um, I compiled a book that came out in January with Orbis books called Jesus Wasn't Killed by the Jews, um, for instance. And uh, we did just celebrate Shavuot and Pentecost. I suspect I'm the only person in the conversation today who actually celebrated both of them actively. <laughs> uh, so again, I have a real interest in this and I have an interest in uh, Rabbi Zaslow and Jack Levison. I've known Jack for 30 years actually and I have known uh, David for maybe 15. But um, you know, you, you don't love all of your authors but I love these two guys. So anyway, I'm very happy to be here. Welcome to everyone who is here. Welcome to everyone in Ashland, Oregon. I think there are probably some synagogue members who have joined us, and I'm grateful for that. Welcome to any and all in Texas who are uh, fans of Jack Levison, because there are many of them. And I'm going to start us off with a question. And let me just say, as sort of structure for the hour, for the next 55 minutes, I'm going to start out with two broad questions for these two guys and they're gonna each answer these broad questions. Then we're gonna get into some back and forth conversation. And by 1.40, I'm gonna sort of cut us off and say, okay, let's make sure we get the questions that people are asking who are watching. I know some people have already sent us questions and we're gonna get a bunch more, but we have you know, two or 300 people who are watching us at least right now. And I think the audience will grow and there will be people who wanna ask questions. So my first question is a very simple one. Could you each take four minutes maybe, Try. And you're both good talkers, so keep your eye on your clock. 
and give us a general overview of what Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit is or means in your religious tradition, trying to represent the tradition broadly, and then insert a little bit of your own particularity as well. And if Rabbi Zeslo might go first, because, you know, the Jews came, came first. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And Professor Jack, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, when we read the uh, Torah, when we read the Tanakh, the Bible in English, um, we're reading it in translation, most of us. And we think in terms of um, Western way of processing data and information, where the, the Bible in the Hebrew Bible uh, is written in this ancient language where words have many more multiple meanings than they do in, in English. So, for example, the, the concept of ruach, which is the, the Hebrew word for spirit, for example, can be translated as wind, can be translated as breath, can be translated as spirit. Now, these are three concepts that in, in Western thinking are diametrically, I won't say opposed to each other, but very different. Wind is nature, a breath is the human body, and spirit is that which is ethereal, where the Hebrew concept of spirit is they're unified. So you'll find different translations, Christian translations of the Bible where it says Ruach Elohim, for example, in, in chapter one of Genesis, where the word Ruach is translated as wind or as breath or spirit. Oh, 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 the wind of God uh, hovered over, uh, the, the breath of God, the spirit of God, because the concept of nature, the physical body and the ethereal God, uh, aspect of God are really a unified whole. So the first thing we have to do is dispense with our normal thought. Uh, if we want to understand from a, Hebrew, a Jewish point of view, Holy Spirit, we have to understand. Um, we have to understand it from a Hebraic point of view. Otherwise, we're thinking in terms of our own definition of Holy Spirit, not what it meant to our ancestors, both the early Christians as well as the uh, ancient ancient Hebrews. So, for example, in uh, in in Psalm. Um, uh, 54, I believe, maybe it's 50, yeah, 51. It says, a heart that is pure created me, Elohim, a spirit in tune, renew within me. Do not cast me away from before you. And your Holy Spirit, Ruach Katshecha, your Holy Spirit take not away from me. Now here's the secret of understanding the Holy Spirit from a Hebraic point of view. Your Holy Spirit take not away from me. So the Holy Spirit is not separate from us as people. Uh, you might say that the soul that God implants in every one of us is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is imminent within, uh, within each of us. So that, in a nutshell, standing on one foot is sort of a, a basic understanding um, uh, of the Holy Spirit from a Jewish point of view. We can't separate God from uh, nature, from our own selves. This is interconnected whole. As separate as we feel from God, uh, so to speak, that's our problem. Uh, God didn't create us to be separate from him, her, it. God created us in a unity with God, uh, but we sense that separation. So that's the purpose of good religion is to bring us to reconcile the, the separation between us and God through the Holy Spirit, through our breathing. Wonderful. And, and you stuck to your four minutes beautifully. Good. Uh, Jack, um, take over. How about you? Yeah. Listening to Rev. David, that's why Christians need Jews to explain the Holy Spirit to them. That's why when I walk into a Sunday school class and they say to me, can Jews have the Holy Spirit after they've read Fresh Air? And I say, yes, but they need to hear it from other than Christians. That was just really wonderful. So I, I start with that. And that in fact is where I believe Christians should start. That is not really where Christians do start their understanding of the spirit, unfortunately. Um, I think Christians begin with Trinity. They begin with the notion that the spirit is one person in the Trinity. So they really don't begin with the notion of breath, wind, or even spirit. They begin with spirit as person. So for most Christian traditions, the Trinity is really important. I think, um, the idea of three hypostases in one usia, three uh, persons in one entity. So when I sit across the table from Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic theologians, this is what usually comes up. Um, 
Now, more colloquially, most Christians begin their understanding of the Holy Spirit, while most begin their understanding of the Holy Spirit with an experience. Um, but with the story of Pentecost, Shavuot, in Acts chapter 2, where they have tongues as of fire and the Spirit fills them and they begin to speak in other languages. So that seems to be, for Christians, the defining story of what it means to understand the Holy Spirit. However, I think in reality, a lot of Christians begin more with Paul's list, the Apostle Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, of spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues, prophecy, healing, administrating, giving. So if we start with the story of Pentecost in Acts 2, we practically tend to begin with spiritual gifts in Acts chap in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. And a lot of that is the influence of Pentecostals throughout the 20th century and the strong emphasis on speaking in tongues and miraculous gifts. So the only other thing I would say is that many mainline Christians really don't know what to do with Pentecost and they really don't know what to do with spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues and healing and that. So in the mainline church, I think you have more of an emphasis upon the fruits of the spirit, kindness, love, peacefulness, that sort of thing. So I think Christians begin with the Trinity. The formative story is Pentecost. The practical starting point is spiritual gifts. And... Um, for mainline people, fruits of the spirit, which are less, so to speak, less miraculous. So I think that's kind of an overview of Christian perspectives on the spirit. Did I stay within four minutes? You did. Well, actually, you have about 30 more seconds. You did great. Um, oh, in that case, it's the power chair. That's what I'm in. <laughs> ah. The W-J-A power chair. See, I, I just, I always describe it as the something fancy chair of, yeah. Okay. All right. So my... <laughs> My next question for both of you, and we'll stay in the same order in terms of who answers. Uh, Jack sort of anticipated in his first sentence that, that he said there a minute ago, which was, I want to know uh, to whom is Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit available? And I want to know how does Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit work in the world? And part three of the question, how would one know if it was taken from them? In other words, that's a further way to understand what Holy Spirit does in the world or in our lives. Rabbi Zaslow. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's a great question. And of course, it comes from a Western perspective that there's a separation between the Holy Spirit and ourselves. And that's the way we, we begin our, from, from our own cultural point of view. So it's not a question of who the Holy Spirit is available to. The Holy Spirit just, it's, it's an isness. It just is. If we weren't alive, I'm not even sure even then we wouldn't have some of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit exists in nature itself, in, in every tree, in every bird, possibly in every river and every rock, in the planet itself. But certainly in every person, regardless of belief or non-belief, the Holy Spirit is the isness of our lives. It's, it's what gives us our, our soul. So from a Hebraic point of view, the Holy Spirit, it's not available well John, if you only convert and become Jewish, you'll get the Holy Spirit, right? Or if you go to a Pentecostal church, uh, Professor Jack, then you'll feel the Holy Spirit. Certainly, a good synagogue, a good mosque, a good church, you will experience the mm -hmm. Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, more in a really hearing a beautiful poem, reading beautiful liturgy, uh, making a statement, a profession of, of faith, you'll feel the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not available. The Holy Spirit is, is what gives you, you it's, it is your life force that brings you to that mosque, church, ashram, synagogue in the first place. So I don't want to make that separation. Who is it available to? It's not just available to everybody. It, it, it's just, it's part of everybody. Jack, how about you? Yeah, um, I agree with that fundamentally, which makes it very hard to be a Christian. <laughs> because Christian's first perspective is, you know, well, what about Pentecost if everybody has the Spirit? Or when Paul writes, the Spirit has been sent into our hearts. Well, how can that be if everybody has the Spirit? And this is the loveliness of Judaism that Christians still haven't quite got, the both and. You know, we're, we like the either or. You either have the Holy Spirit or you don't. But 
what what Rev David said was, yes, we do. So a couple biblical texts, and they happen to be both Hebrew Bible. The book of Daniel, when you were talking about Isness, the book of Daniel has like 12 references to Ruach, Ruach Yati Ra, this exceptional Ruach in Daniel. But as, as, as far as I know, there is no single verb used in the book of Daniel associated with the spirit. So the spirit doesn't fill, the spirit doesn't rush, the spirit doesn't come upon, the spirit doesn't blow, the spirit doesn't hover, the spirit simply. And I think we need to begin there. The spirit simply, Ruach HaKodesh, not even is. I take even the isness out of it there. So wait, the first wait, thing is- the English. Wait, give us the English, Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, Holy Spirit. That's it, okay. Yeah, or spirit, ruach yatira, which is a word that means like when the furnace, the fiery furnace was really hot, it was yatira. When the statue of Nebuchadnezzar was really tall, it was yatira. And the spirit in Daniel, really, there it is. You know, so that three pagan rulers over three generations could say, wow, ruach yatira in Daniel. And so, it doesn't even, I mean, this is in um, Fresh Air, John, you know, chapter two, Daniel's discipline. The spirit isn't always about coming upon us or rushing upon us or causing us to do something. The spirit simply there. Uh, Rev. David, do you want to respond to that? Because then I'm going to do another biblical text. I well, think I, just, I, I, I just want to point out in terms of what, how you defined Christianity at the very beginning, Judaism is the same way. Judaism has been so influenced in the positive aspects of Western thinking, Neoplatonic thinking, from Maimonides on, especially a thousand years ago till now, that my job is also to get my congregation or the people that I'm teaching away from the either or ness of of our choices and into the bothness um of, of of either or choices so it's really my job is really to teach jews how to think hebraically it's not like we automatically do the only thing we're lucky is that you might go back to the greek text first i'm not saying you personally or the latin text first where we go back right to the hebrew text first so the moment we open up that lexicon and we see the multiple meanings of particular words, the either onus is just is usually eradicated. It's just it's just gone. And so with that unity, then we see, for example, uh, I won't call it a, a trinity, but there is a triune unity within Judaism as well. And it's uh, it's very similar to the, tri uh, to, to the trinity. It says in the Zohar, Kucha Barichu, the Holy One, blessed be He, Yisrael, the Jewish people, Israel, Vioraita, the Torah, Chadhu, they're one. So this concept of, of, of God, uh, the people, um, and the Torah are one, is this triune unity, and sort of enmeshing them or bringing them all together is this concept of the Ruach HaKodesh. It's the Holy Spirit that binds them all together. You know, Christians talk about, uh, well, most Christians don't, but theological Christians talk about perichoresis. And perichoresis is that kind of dance that unites the Trinity. And it's thought that the Holy Spirit can be very much a part of that unifying presence of the Spirit. So now, I, I, having said, having agreed 100% with um, Rev. David, because I begin with the Hebrew Bible when I do any of my work on the Spirit. In fact, Scott McKnight, uh, John Scott McKnight, did a re he's doing a series of blogs in Christianity Today on uh, another book I wrote, and he calls it Ruachology, because <laughs> Pneumatology is a study of the spirit from the perspective of the Greek Pneuma, emphasizing New Testament and on. And what uh, another paraclete author, Scott McKnight, knows is that when I begin, I begin in Hebrew Bible with Ruach, so he, f he coined the term Ruachology rather than Pneumatology, which I think is actually an ex excellent way to begin. So it's okay for Christians to say we receive the spirit. Um, what's not okay is to say then, but they don't. I think, you know, John, we're sort of circling around your very difficult series of questions. It was pretty, pretty intense questions. But I, I think it's okay to say I received the spirit in my heart or I received the spirit and I spoke in tongues or I received the spirit. That is Christian language. I received the spirit. But that doesn't mean that they have it 
out there. So I, I wrote a book called Filled with the Spirit, a big academic book back in 2009. And one of the respondents was Frank Machia, a Pentecostal theologian. And he wrote a beautiful response that said, just because we bask in the glow of revivalism doesn't mean everything outside of that glow and everything before that glow was void of the spirit. That's the step that many Christians feel compelled that they can compelled to make that I don't think they need to make. It's like saying, I have a really good bottle of water. You don't. Right. It's, it's, I, it's, I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. Jim. I, I want to jump in because neither of you have answered the third part of my question. I'm not sure I say that's the first or second, but. Oh, no, the first there. or second, I think you've done very well. But the third part is what specifically does Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit do in the world, in my life? And to really demonstrate that, how would I know if all of a sudden that was taken from me or it was taken out of the universe? It's a great question. And of course, what we're left with is, is a mystery because if we have this notion that the Holy Spirit is not separate from us, that we're, let me use the, this great Vietnamese Buddhist Thich Nhat, Thich Nhat Hanh's term, interbeing, that in a sense, we think we're breathing, but Thich Nhat Hanh says we're really being breathed. We're, we are interbeing with the divine. So the Holy Spirit, in a sense, is breathing, breathing us. We're being breathed. We think we're breathing, but that's just from a, a an f, from a anthropocentric point of view, uh, as opposed to being breathed. So I don't know if I can really answer that question. How would we know if it's taken away? I, I don't think there would be any knowing this. I'm not. I, I just don't think we would exist uh, if we. I don't. I can't answer that. I, I just maybe, don't... maybe this is where theology meets particle physics. I'm not sure. Uh, yes. Jack, Jack, what do you say? I can answer it by going exactly back to what uh, Rev. David said at the very beginning. So Psalm 51 says, take not your Ruach HaKodesh from me. Do not cast me away from your presence. If we did not have the Ruach, we would die. Yeah. Secondly, right. if we didn't right. have the Ruach, there'd be no wind in our world. Texas right. would be even hotter. Right. Um, thirdly, when the spirit comes and fills us to the brim, so uh, this beautiful text, it's one of my favorite texts in the whole of scripture, is in Exodus 28. I mean, it's not a text most people read, but it's, it's the making of uh, Aaron's vestments for the tabernacle, and it describes the artisans, not in English, you look in English Bibles, they don't have a reference to Ruach there, as God says, I have filled them with ruach of wisdom. I have filled them up. And that word mille, fill up, means filling up to the brim. We would have no creativity if we didn't have ruach in us. The fact that we don't acknowledge ruach doesn't mean ruach is not there. Ruach yeah. does breathe us. Ruach does blow around us. Ruach does fill us and give us creativity. And then you could add other elements too. But imagine uh, Barga, Italy, without the Paraclete house and all the creativity and grace and gardening that goes on there. <laughs> Gone. Beautifully stated. And let me just add one more, maybe it's, a, a, again, another mystery, is that even if we weren't alive, the Holy Spirit is still in whatever unaliveness we are. In other words, our, our physical bodies it's possible that the Holy Spirit is still filling that. In other words, existence couldn't exist without some aspect of Ruach uh, within all aspects of, of, of nature, especially when you go back to Genesis 1-2, because this Holy Spirit is, is, is hovering, brooding like a, um, the same word as a bird over its eggs, Rachaf, it's, uh, it's brooding over, the, over existence itself. There were no people at that time. That's the, an ina, inanimate world. It's an inanimate uh, mm -hmm. uh, chaos and void, so to speak, tohu and vohu. And yet there's a Holy Spirit that's still there. So I don't, know if, I don't know if it needs people. It certainly doesn't need Jews and Christians for the Holy Spirit to exist. Now, let, let's talk for a second about the holidays that we are in the midst of celebrating uh, uh, or have just celebrated, Shavuot for, for Jews and Pentecost for Christians. Um, probably everyone watching knows that there's no, it's no accident that Passover and Easter come at about the same time every year. 
there's no accident that Shavuot and Pentecost come at the same time, roughly every year. Shavuot is the giving of the Torah to the Jews. Uh, Pentecost is the giving of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church, according to Christian tradition. Say something about, is there, what's the link there? What, what, what is it that's similar between the giving of the Torah or Torah to Jews in the life of, of uh, in Jewish life and uh, Holy Spirit, perhaps in the life of a Christian? Beautiful question. I, I, and I, here's when we come into sacred metaphor. Metaphor doesn't mean less than real. It means it's so real I can only express it through analogy. So let's say take the, 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 the Trinity in Christianity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In a sense, it's a parallel metaphor that's used within Judaism of God, Israel, and Torah. That God representing, let's say, the Father and, and Israel representing the Son, uh, and then the Holy Spirit representing the Torah. That there's a revelation of that Torah that Holy Spirit takes in, it takes animate, it takes uh, takes incarnate form at, at at Mount Sinai for us, but it's a parallel story. I remember um, an Episcopal priest friend of mine, uh, Ann Bartlett, uh, Reverend Ann Bartlett. I, I was telling her, I said, "Wow, there's this really link between the exile, our slavery, the redemption, our liberation, and then the revelation 50 days later, the Pentecost." There's this an amazing link in the Hebrew. I'm not going to go into it, but it's actually the same word root for exile, redemption, and revelation. And when you study this Gimel Lamed root, you see, wow, there's this deep interconnection between I got enslaved, I got liberated, and I found out why, the revelation. And she says, well, that's just the same with us as Christians. You see, Friday night, Good Friday, really is our exile. But Sunday morning is our redemption. And we start counting also, and 50 days later is the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So these, these different faith traditions are utilizing the same energetic revelation that God has presented to each of us um, in our own unique way, not because one is right or, or better than another, but it fits our particular cultural condition better. So Jack is a Christian. I'm a Jew. Our stories are parallel. They're uniquely harmonious to one another. How about you, Jack? Yeah, I... I, I um... On the day of Pentecost, one of the most overlooked things is when they speak in other languages, in other tongues, they speak the praiseworthy acts of God, ta megalea tu theu. Um, this is a phrase used in the Greek translation of Deuteronomy of the Exodus, all the events of the Exodus. So when the people at Pentecost spoke, they actually had a message. They weren't going blabbering around. They had a message that probably began with creation and moved on to Exodus and moved into exile and for them would have moved all the way up to Jesus. They had a litany of God's praiseworthy acts so that Pentecost isn't, it is about how we can tell the story of God essentially is what Pentecost is from creation to uh, Jesus and on to our own life for them. Um, I think the backdrop of Pentecost for me is a verse in the book of Nehemiah. I love these little arcane verses like Exodus 28. In Nehemiah 9, Ezra, who is a scribe, is praying to the post-exilic community during the Persian era. And, and I, I was trying to look it up. It says, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Spirit instruction tied at the hip, giving of Torah, giving of spirit, Shavuot, Pentecost, tied at the hip. It is a great pity that for many Christians, the miracle of Pentecost is thought to be something ecstatic, void of a deep intellectual commitment to learning our scriptures, which begin with Genesis 1. So, I think there's a tremendous parallel, a unity between Shavuot, the giving of Torah, and Pentecost, the giving of spirit, as in the prayer of Ezra, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Beautiful, Jack. Yes, okay. thank you. Now, I, you, you two should you ask each other a question. I mean, we, we have about 10 minutes still before we're going to turn it over to all the questions that people who are watching might bring, but what do you want to know from each other? Well, I, I don't want to make it provocative too, too much, but I want to provoke a little bit. 
which is this notion of triumphalism um, that I know you two don't ascribe to, that we've got it and you don't. And once you get a triumphalism, then you have the concept of domination and domination uh, and to occupy another one's faith, to say you're going to hell unless you believe ABC. So I'm wondering, Jack, what's going on with the Holy Spirit in the church today that busts apart or shifts or transforms the triumphalism that was so much part of the uh, pre-Vatican II church. What's going on today? G give us, give me a report. Give me some hope, I hope, uh, from, from a church point of view and what's going on with the dismantling of triumphalism without losing the, the real true essence of the gospel. There are pr some pretty significant uh, theologians, Jürgen Moltmann, um, uh, Pannenberg, Volkart Pannenberg, and um, Reiner, Rahner, Karl Rahner. And these are all sort of post-Vatican II theologians, both Protestant and Catholic. And all of them really begin with Hebrew scriptures to understand the spirit. So the triumphalism, I think, of Christianity is rooted in a dichotomy, one of those doggone dichotomies between the spirit of creation and the spirit of salvation. And so for Christians, there can be a spirit of creation, but we have the spirit of salvation. And when you talk in that ter in those terms, and I have the spirit of salvation, you're, you're automatically excluding people. Well, Moltmann, Rahner, Pannenberg all begin with the spirit of creation and the spirit that can infuse our environment with life. And so they talk about beginning with the spirit God gives to all people and all creation and allowing salvation to come out of that, rather than beginning with, I have the spirit, I am saved, and it doesn't really matter what happens outside of that spirit, of that. So I think there are theologians trying to undercut the pre, exactly, pre-Vatican II um, triumphalism, which unfortunately is very much a part of modern American Christianity now, the sort of exclusive triumphalism uh, which is held by many. And, and not only that, just to add to that, it seems like with what you're proposing or what you're saying is happening will suddenly lead us to the notion that the spirit, the Ruach, also exists in nature as wind, and therefore there's some planetary obligation on, a, on an ecological level, on a planetary level, that if the planet has no spirit, if there's no Ruach, so what's the difference? Let's just exploit nature use it in any way we want. But if, 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 if God is imminent in a tree, in the, in, the, in the soil, in the earth, we're going to have a whole different view of ecology than we do right now, which is I do such a good deed because I take my plastic bottle and recycle it. I think we need to see spirit as wind, as actually the, the, the fresh air that refreshes the, the, the planet itself. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I mean, I, I you know, when I when I go in and teach a Sunday school class or something, if they allow me to use numbers, you know, ruach occurs 378 times in the Jewish scriptures, plus 11 in the book of Daniel. So 389 times. Pneuma, the Greek word for spirit, occurs 379 times, almost exactly as many, though a lot of those are to mm. evil spirits. Similarly, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, ruach does mean, you know, it shades towards wind, toward breath. But I don't like the sort of slicing and dicing spirit as breath, spirit as wind, spirit as spirit, spirit as person, spirit as power, which often you read in Christian pneumatologies. That's the way they deal with the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible is that they, they, they subdivide it. And I think that just ruins our ability to see unity in creation, unity in people, unity between religions, unity between individuals. Um, it makes me deeply sad having started my work in Hebrew Bible. I actually began my work on the spirit in Second Temple Judaism. So in the works of Philo and Josephus and those kind of works is where I really began. And then I went back into Hebrew Bible and up in the New Testament. But so often when people begin with the New Testament, it comes with a theological perspective of exclusivism so that everything else gets packaged differently. And I think poorly. Right. And I think this is where my hope has always been for Christianity, that if they find their roots, it doesn't mean they become Jewish, but they see that 
the root and branch are pr profoundly interconnected together. There's so much that Christians can learn uh, by understanding how to use a lexicon, how to how to go back to the what did the Hebrews how did they use that word? What did they what did they think the me meaning of the word was? You wouldn't quite get this dialectic. You get more of a dialogue but, but, but between the between the two, and especially with this concept of ruach, you know, with this concept of wind, breath, spirit, that they're it, that they're an interconnected whole. Sounds like we would benefit from an English translation of Hebrew scripture that did not translate the word ruach, but just left it there. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not just that word. Yeah, I mean, we would we would do well just by learning how to really use an interlinear Bible, so we could uh, go back to the Hebrew word and then go to the Strong's Concordance, and then or it's to Jesenius, or you know, to to see what the word word meant. I I often thought of uh, translating Genesis, but not translating one word for each Hebrew word, but multiple words for each Hebrew word. So that, you know, but I sheet in, in the beginning, when God began, I would use both those terms. And when I saw the word ruach, I'd say wind, spirit, breath, we use all three of those terms. I think that would be fascinating, a little bit closer to the Hebraic mindset. I tend to hyphenate when I do spirit breath. Uh -huh, nice. uh, I don't do spirit wind breath. I do do spirit breath just to keep reminding us that it's not spirit in the spiritual realm and That's breath right. in the material realm. Again, these dichotomies. I think what we're seeing today and what you're pointing out, all of us are saying, the, the dichotomies we've been taught to bring to the text do not apply here. Um, material, spiritual, creation, salvation. They don't work. But, right. uh, you know, right. yeah. It's like when, when John and I many years ago were talking about people will say uh, to him, to me, uh, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And there's a reason people are saying that because religion is too often Judaism and Christianity and Islam have lost their spirit. Where, for example, all of people who don't come to my synagogue, they'll go into nature, they'll take a walk through the park and they think, oh man, I feel the spirit in nature. Well, of course, because it's that's, where, that's where it's so <laughs> imminent. So I have to, what I'm trying to do in my synagogue is to emulate or imitate what exists out there. I can't blame people for saying they're spiritual, not religious, because they go to too many synagogues or too many churches where the spirit, so to speak, seems not to be there. It's just dead. It's just picking up a book and reading some credo or reading some hymn. And it's not even a good, it's not even a good melody. I think they also say uh, that same statement when they go to an art museum or a concert, yeah. you know, where creativity is flowing and bubbling and beauty and art and people find their church or their synagogue in those places too, because there's spirit. That's right. However, not that I am a friend of provocation, but um, I, I think that is a cop-out to the however many people out there, because the real work of the spirit comes when we can in community do things we could never have done as individuals. I believe firmly, if you look at both Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, the spirit works best in community. So when those artisans are making a tabernacle, they're all not wandering in the wilderness finding the spirit. They're working together and creating something magnificent in a desert. Um, it's the communal work that's so hard. I mean, yeah, I can love a tree, but boy, I don't know if I can love some of my colleagues at SMU. That is where the work of the spirit has to be deeply embraced. So I do think we can, we can love the spirit in nature or in an art museum or at a concert, but the real rub of the work of the spirit comes in Joel, right? In the book of Joel, I will pour out my spirit and your slaves will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will have visions, your male and females will be inspired. Let's see if we can come up with a community like that. And then, John, your question, what happens when there's no spirit? We'll know, because the, the, the spirited community, the spirit-filled community, the spirit-rushed community does some magnificent things 
that a bunch of individuals can't do. Yes. It, yes. I mean, preach it, brother. Uh, I, 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 this is J J Jack needs to come and preach at the uh, Havara Synagogue. In oh man, I Any do time, need to be out. I'll anytime, come to Ashland. Anytime you're in Ashland, you're welcome to preach in my synagogue. It's great. All right, we, we we are now going to turn it over to Sister Estelle, who hopefully has a solid. Uh, internet connection and is going to feed us some questions that people have. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I'm so I apologize and I can you hear me okay? Not it's, very. No, not it's, very. It's, it's breaking up, Sister Estelle. Okay. Well, Rachel's right here and Rachel's going to jump in then. I'm sorry for that. Hi, everybody. There Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi there. Hi. Here's a question from um, Jared Ludlow. He says, why is Holy Ghost sometimes used for the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition, but not in the Jewish tradition? Wait a second, I'm stuck on Jared Ludlow. Hi, Jared. <laughs> Jared's a friend of mine who's a professor. So, oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I think that's Jared Ludlow. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, he says, why is Holy Ghost sometimes used for the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition, but not in Jewish tradition? Well, well, that's a great question. Uh, and actually, I'm not even sure the word Holy Spirit is used much in the Jewish tradition. In other words, we're a root religion. So we, we'll go back to Ruach HaKodesh, but we will avoid the, we don't believe in translations. We know that a translation is an interpretation. So I, I don't think I, hardly ever heard the term Holy Spirit used in my synagogue. I know what it means. People know what it means. But we have to go back to the... the, the so ghost, ghost used to mean something different than it does today's connotation. We have Casper the ghost. But in, in, in you know, a thousand years ago in medieval times or even during the Renaissance, ghost meant spirit, the, the ghost of someone, the spirit of somebody. So no, we don't use the term Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit is a better translation. But I think in Judaism, we avoid that term too and just prefer just go right back to the root. Uh, Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, uh, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. I, I do not is. know the answer to that question. I'm looking up in my Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, and it just says an alternative uh, title of the Holy Spirit in liturgical usage. Hmm. Yeah, See, John, he's, he, Jack's a real scholar. He has his books ready. So <laughs> he has a question. That? He's going to look it up. It is ever wrecked. No, I'm, I'm going to have to go get my, <laughs> my books. Okay. Good I had to import everything to my uh, our dining table. <laughs> but I just think, I, I don't know, but Jared, obviously I can, we can look that one up. But I, I don't know when, uh, obviously though, I think ghost is the more person word. So it allows to emphasis upon the person. It's a holy ghost. It's not a holy um, power. Oh. Uh, but I, otherwise I don't know. Okay. Next question. Next question. An anonymous attendee is asking, what practices and ways of being do you encourage to become more aware of the spirit, capital S, within? Great question. Uh, in Judaism, we're going through a big renewal now, the reform, reconstructionist renewal and conservative movement, even the orthodox movement are all going through transformation to understand that in the Hebrew, the outside and the inside are connected together. Even the word prayer, for example, tefillah in Hebrew, also means not just praying to God outside, but also to self-judge, to evaluate, to go inside your own self. So certainly the, the liberal Judaisms, I don't mean politically, but the liberal reconstructionist uh, reform and, and, and renewal Judaisms are definitely really being influenced by, um, by, by Buddhist meditational practices, and then, so to speak, making them kosher, bringing them into Judaism. So we're doing a lot of internal reflection to feel that spirit, that life force, that God spark within every one of us. So we're doing a lot of inner work now based upon um, very, very much uh, in, influenced, uh, inspired by Buddhist and Christ, Christian mystical traditions as well. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think breathing, learning really deeply how to breathe every day is a very important thing. I mean, that's one thing in quarantine has given many of us. It's the opportunity to, yeah. to actually sense our breath. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is, uh, again, we don't want to be material versus spiritual. The material act of breathing when we're attentive can be a very deeply spiritual act. Ab absolutely. And in fact, like in Psalm 150, it ends, Kol Han Shema Halal Yah, every soul praises Yah. 
but kol hanshema, the word neshama, is the word for breath as well. Neshima, neshama, soul and breath. So it's not just may every soul praise God, but may every breath praise God. So it, modern Judaism are taking that literally as well. In other words, let every breath be a, a hallelujah, a praise of God. Mm -hmm. And, and, and sis, um, Rachel, or I would add to that too as well, um, from the story of the artisans in the desert, I mean, developing skills that God can use and fill us so that in community, they can become something more than just individual skills. Mm -hmm. And then from the book of Joel, the, the outpouring of the spirit and the disruption of the social status quo. Mm -hmm. I think in our day um, with all that's going on and the disruption of the status quo, I think we as people of faith need to be particularly attentive to the outpouring of the spirit yeah. um, so that um, so that slaves can um, prophesy. Good. Thank Amen. you. Thank you. There, this is um, speaking of the gifts of the spirit and, and, and these practices that you're, you're talking about here. Here's a comment and a question from Caroline Collins. She says, some Christians I have spoken with believe that some, but not all, spiritual gifts have died off, in quotes, such as prophecy, speaking in tongues, visions, etc. She must be Southern because she says, what advice do y'all have regarding responding to these perspectives? <laughs> yeah, Pro prophecy is, is, is a dangerous one because there are too many false prophets in the world who claim they know exactly uh, what caused the pandemic. It's the Jews, it's the Christians, it's homosexuals, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, too many Christians, Muslims, and Jews, I'm blaming the three monotheistic religions the most, have an idea that their prophecy is, is, is correct. So it's a little bit dangerous. So uh, there's a Jewish notion that when we hear uh, something that we think God said, we have to bring it to a, 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 we have to bring it to a panel of three judges. And those three judges have to agree that what I heard, what I understood was truly the, the, the Holy Spirit, because there's a 50-50 chance that it's my imagination versus being authentic. And then if it's authentic, there's a 50-50 chance that it either comes from Satan or it comes from God. So if I have a, a sense of prophecy, I only have a 25% chance that it's, that it's from God anyway. So we're very, very careful about what's called gifts of the spirits. On the other hand, just to make it brief, the gifts of the spirit of singing, of dancing, of movement, of making our services alive again, that's also a gift of the spirit. So it's sort of like Pentecostal Judaism says, let's just sing, let's make it ecstatic, let's, let's really make our services joyous. Um, and uh, let me add a little bit to that. And it's Caroline, Rachel was this- Yes, Caroline, Caroline okay. Collins, yep. But Caroline, that's a really good question. And yes, it's a really good Southern question, especially <laughs> because, um, this is a, a theological perspective, and my wife, who's upstairs, is an historian of American religion. She could do this better than I, but um, it's called dispensationalism, that world history is divided into various dispensations, right? So you have the dispensation of the church when the spiritual gifts were active. But now, so says dispensationalism, the spiritual gifts are no longer needed. So um, this little book, Fresh Air, that John Sweeney edited brutally, and I wrote, <laughs> I begin with a story of when I was 15 years old on Long Island, not far from, uh, 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 Rev David and I grew up pretty near each other. He's Brooklyn, I was, Long, I was Hicksville, Long Island. And this, this visiting minister, about 22 years old, came out and my parents had him over afterwards for cold cuts and Jewish rye bread and that sort of thing. <laughs> and um, during this time, he sat on the deck chair and he said, well, the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect comes, that which is imperfect will pass away. The perfect was the Bible and the imperfect was spiritual gifts. And Paul knew that when the Bible came, we wouldn't need spiritual gifts anymore. That is the worst case scenario for dispensational <laughs> theology, that now we have the Bible, we don't need these gifts. But it's a kind of American theology, which I think began by, oh, where's Priscilla? Arthur Darby Knox, I believe, called dispensationalism. I think it's 
fundamentally mistaken. I don't see why you can't have the Bible and spiritual gifts as well. Thank you, Jack. That really clarified something for me too, because obviously in Judaism, we don't use the term spiritual gifts. I was referring to it in the more, mm -hmm. the aesthetics of our, of our church synagogue, to make our aesthetics a gift of the spirit. If I'm an artist, to decorate my sanctuary beautifully. If I'm a singer, to create beautiful melodies to the ancient hymns. To me, those are, or at least, I think within Judaism in general, those are the gifts of the spirit. Mm. Yeah, and they are gifts of the spirit. And they um, are, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Caroline. We have two um, scripture specific questions. So I'll start with um, Ezekiel. Beth Ernest says, thank you for this conversation. Can you say something about the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel, specifically Ezekiel chapter 37 and the reconstituting power of the spirit in resurrecting people, the nation of Israel, and I hope the church. Can we claim or expect this power today? Wow. Well, I don't think you can get to chapter 37 unless you go through chapter one. <laughs> so uh, when you come into chapter one of Ezekiel, you see a wheel within a wheel and what's called the tetramorph, this whole idea of the, the lion and, and, and the ox and, and, and the eagle and the human being an interconnected whole. Whatever he saw, whatever his vision was, led him to this you know, concept of, of, of Michaye Hametim, that that which is dead is going to come alive again. Um, that nothing really does die in the first place. It just recycles. Uh, when you think about the, the amazing nature of just simple recycling uh, or composting, uh, you see that that which dies then comes alive again. Resurrection, from a Jewish point of view, is a natural process that already exists in nature. Reincarnation already exists in nature. I've been reincarnated several times within my own lifetime. It's just this recycling of who I was and who I'm becoming. And I think it's the same thing to understand a Jewish point of view of, of resurrection has to do, well, there are two, there are two, there, there's a division within Judaism. Some believe that literally the dead who've died will actually r rise up again. The, the dry bones will come and go back to Jerusalem. And some believe it's just part of the natural process of, uh, of, uh, of, of recycling of that which has died, which is gonna come alive again. Hmm. If this is the Beth Ernest I know, uh, get your husband to spring for a book that's not published by Erdman's. Um, this Pericle Press book that um, you may have it. I think you probably even have it. Um, I have a section on Ezekiel 37 um, and the Valley of Dry Bones. And what, what I noticed in this beautiful passage is that the sequence takes a very long time. They don't know, they don't, the wind doesn't come and then they all of a sudden jump together into a new life, into a, a lively community. You have promises and then you have bones and then you have sinews and you have flesh and then there's still no ruach. And then finally Ezekiel prophesies to the ruach and then the ruach comes and then they finally stand up. And it's this kind of crescendo of expectation and it takes a very long time and um, so, yes, I firmly believe there can be this resurrection of community. I do, I do, I do. But it's painful. It's not simple. It's not single. It's not harmonious. It's clattering and clanking of bones together. And they don't stand up like in a military tattoo or a band on the 50 yard line. That's not how resurrection of a community happens. And so I want to read you a paragraph from Fresh Air. Um, because I think this is, yes, I believe this happens, but I think we're seeing now, even as a nation, how painful resurrection and reformation and transformation are. So I wrote a friend of mine who works for World Vision once told me how workers deal with starving children. At the acute stages of starvation, the body shuts down. That's the Valley of Dry Bones. It's numb, no longer ravenous, not even hungry. So aid workers place sugar water on the lips of the starving children. Eventually, after days of this simple treatment, the fortunate ones begin to feel hunger again. And when they do, they begin to feel intense pain. They scream and bellow and wail as their small bodies again begin to beg for water and bread. They're resurrected and the midwife of new life is overwhelming pain. So I believe that Ezekiel 37 gives us a clear vision of resurrection of community, but also of the protracted pain that's required to bring us to new life. 
I'm going to inject. You did a very Jewish move there. You took this spiritual archetype and just brought it back down to earth in terms of people, people suffering. And that's, I think, really my message today, to understand the, the relationship between our spiritual life and our moral life to make this world a better place is doing God's work. And if you separate it and think, well, I'm spiritually, I'm deeply connected to God. In fact, I have salvation. Um, I'm saved. Big deal. The world is on fire now. The world is in pain. Racism is systemic and we haven't dealt with that issue. Poverty is systemic. We haven't dealt with that issue. The Valley of the Dry Bones, that's great. Make it spiritual. Read Ezekiel 37, but also realize we have obligations here on earth to take those dry bones and to, to connect them to the sinews and the musculature. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Beth. Here's one more um, question about a, a specific scripture. David Brown says, could you both speak on 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed. All right, you start, Jack. Six. Yeah, I'd probably, that's probably my text more than you know, <laughs> Second <laughs> Timothy, what, 2.16? <laughs> 316. It's okay. a, a major text on the inspiration of scripture. Mm -hmm. I wish my dear friend, Rob Wall, who teaches at Seattle Pacific University were here. Rob really has this one down, Pat. But uh, first of all, all scripture is inspired. All scripture there means the Septuagint, probably the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that the early church used. We know that the early church used the Greek translation of the Bible. So all scripture is inspired by God, but the real key is for reproof, for correction, for training in justice or righteousness. What I believe that text is saying is not that the spirit is inspired and God breathed some sort of ontological way, but the spirit has breathed into scripture the ability to train us, the ability to make us more just, the ability to correct us when we are off kilter. So Rob Wall, I'm channeling Rob Wall's spirit here. Um, all spirit, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness so that the human being, the person of God may be equipped for every good work. I mean, this goes back 50 years for me. I memorized this text. I think that's a reference only to the, I'll call it the Old Testament at this point, only to the Septuagint. It's not about the New Testament, which didn't exist yet. And it's about how, how that those scriptures can be used as we go on in life to teach, correct, and to train us into how to be righteous and just people. So it's more how the scriptures are used than something sort of ontological about the nature of the scriptures. Uh, I'm pretty sure of that. I'm main. I'm, I'm going to say I'm main to that because I, I, I obviously don't know the verse well enough to comment on it, <laughs> except to say in terms of this concept of tochacha or rebuke or reproof, that each of our faith traditions needs to do some inner work with our scriptures. There are texts in, Judea, in, the, in the Torah that seem today by today's standards to be terror texts. There are texts in the Christian scriptures, certainly uh, the way Good Friday story is un unfolded from quotes from Matthew and John that seem to be terror texts. There are texts within the Quran that seem to be terror texts that each of us has to do our own inner work and do reproof within our own scripture. So I wouldn't agree that all scripture is inspired. All scripture was inspired, but there may have been some errors that need to be corrected. Now that may seem heretical to, I'm sure, uh, many religious Jews and religious Christians, but I think that's the work of interpretation, is to say, well, this was for then, but today, this is what we're doing today. Yeah, and I didn't even address the sort of more philosophical question. I don't think that question was about inerrancy. Um, Right, I see. But, but, but really, yeah, I, I, which I didn't even think about when I heard the question. The, the, for me, the question of that text is the usefulness of scripture, not the kind of ontological inerrant uh, uh, scripture. This is how right. scripture is used, not so much. Right, right. Other. Because when I get a question, a question from certain very religious Christians, do you believe in the inerrancy of, of, the, of the Bible? I'll go, well, which translation are you speaking about? Because all translations by their nature are errant. You know, they're errant from the original. So you have to go back to that original if you want to get to some level of inerrancy. And even there, the errancy 
you know, what existed thousands of years ago. If I decided to take a couple of more wives, um, just because <laughs> Abraham did, uh, my wife wouldn't <laughs> like it too much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, oh my gosh, we have so many questions, but I'm, I'm sad to say we've reached the top of the hour. So um, I'm sorry to all of you that we didn't get to. There are so many thank yous, so many um, words of gratitude for this conversation right now. Um, many requests that we do it again sometime. So <laughs> we'll have to think about that. I know everyone's schedules are so busy, but um, and I apologize that my video isn't working. We're running into all kinds of technical difficulties today, but mostly just want to say thank you so much, Rev David, Jack, and John for sharing with us today. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us. And, um, oops, excuse me. Um, I wanna make sure everyone knows, Sister Estelle's been posting links in the chat bar here, but um, Rabbi David Zaslow's two books with Paraclete, Jesus, First Century Rabbi, and Reimagining Exodus, as well as Jack Levison's three books, Fresh Air, 40 Days with the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit, I Pray, as well as John Sweeney's many books with Paraclete are available from your local booksellers, and of course, from paracletepress.com. Now today, if you use the coupon code Holy Spirit Live, you will receive 20% off any of our products on our website. Free shipping is available this month on orders over $45. So we ask you, please consider gifting these books to friends and family. Maybe you belong to um, small study groups or book clubs that would like to use them. They just make uh, a terrific summer study and Father's Day is coming up as well. So we ask you to please consider all of these wonderful, wonderful books. Your generosity will help support Reb David, Jack and John in their work and ministries as well as Paraclete Press in our ongoing work in providing free webinars such as this one today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety, and we hope you'll join us for more of these times together with our authors. Our calendar of Zoom events is available on our website, paracletepress.com. So thank you again so much, Rev. David. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, John. Shalom to everyone. Rev. David, thank you. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Jack, wonderful to be with you. And thank oh, you, John. Wonderful to meet you and to talk. Thanks you, all of thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. It's been lovely.